Hello, I'm Yoram Chazoni, and this is NatCon Talk, where nationalism and conservatism meet. Today I'll be talking to Chris DeMuth, the legendary former head of the American Enterprise Institute. He's now a fellow at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C., and chairman of the National Conservatism Conference. Chris DeMuth, welcome to NatCon Talk. Yoram, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Well, I'm really excited to have you, Chris. I know that uh, many people have been confused these last few years about what's happening to conservatism. And more than anybody else that I know, you kind of embody that history. You, you worked at the Reagan administration. You were the head of the, the American Enterprise Institute for more than 20 years. And uh, today you're involved in national conservatism. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into all of that uh, later. But I would just want to start by asking you, tell us a little bit about how, how did you become a conservative? Were, were you born a conservative? How did you get into all of this? I, I was born into a, uh, uh, my, my parents were Adlai Stevenson Democrats in the 1960s. And uh, I was involved in uh, the civil rights movement a little, you know, a little bit in the 1960s. So I think that my origins uh, were, were liberal, uh, but uh, those, those were the views of a very young person. And you, a young person will tend to default to liberalism because that's a way of indicating that he's really a good person uh, right. and cares about social improvement. Um, but when I began to take uh, government politics ideas seriously and made them a subject of study, um, I, be I, I you could say I began moving to the right, uh, but uh, actually I, I realized that I, I was a pretty conservative person. Uh, that is, I had a great deal of respect for inherited uh, institutions, uh, traditions, ways of life, uh, and a, uh, a moderate, uh, an insistent reformer, but moderate and empirical. And when I worked in politics, in the civil rights movement, in, uh, in government first, in the Nixon administration, uh, and then later on with, uh, with Ronald Reagan, um, and confronted the realities of government um, uh, up close. Uh, I think that I, uh, I think that my innate my innate skepticism about the concentration of power uh, and the the relationship of uh, high degrees of uh, of power in government to the actual. Uh, improvement of social conditions uh, changed, and I became a strong uh, skeptic of uh, of government. Uh, so I th I'd say it was both through uh, uh, practical life and uh, and lucubration, sitting, studying, and writing, uh, that I came to these views. And how how do you get to uh, to conservative thought? I, I I seem to remember you're telling me that you fell in with a kind of a a, a certain intellectual circle. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about that. I um, I, I first uh, I fell in with the group that we now would call the neoconservatives. Although for young people listening, uh, neoconservative has come to mean people that favor a hawkish foreign policy for America. Uh, the original neoconservatism of the 1960s and 1970s was a rather different affair. It was born of disillusionment uh, with uh, the great society, uh, many of the uh, exertions of, uh, of government and reform efforts of the 1960s. Uh, it, was, uh, it was empirical. Uh, it was, uh, as Irving Kristol said, liberals who were mugged by uh, reality and were seeking a new set of, uh, of answers. What, what I've always been doing is just looking for the most powerful, persuasive intellectuals I could find, uh, get next to them and try to figure out what they were doing and see if I could mimic them in some way. But how does that get you to the Reagan administration? Uh, you, you were, a lot of people don't remember this anymore. You know, it's kind of funny, funny for us, you know, to, to, to think about it this way, but many people don't actually remember the Reagan administration. And when I when I look back on it, I think about uh, those days as days that were um, uh, in, intense and and exciting because it seemed that Reagan was uh, was bringing 
you know, a new spirit of uh, love of love of nation and uh, concern for uh, religious tradition, in, in, in addition, of course, to his his love of freedom. Um, that that's what brought me into all of this. But at the at the time that I was, you know, starting a student magazine, you were actually in the Reagan White House. That's correct. That's so correct. So what, what 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 was it like in there? I was I was very impressed with uh, with Ronald Reagan in the ways that you describe. Uh, I didn't know that a political official could talk about patriotism, could talk about religion uh, in the open, uh, heart on the sleeve uh, uh, terms uh, that that Reagan did. The, this was this was clearly a different sort of political leader than we had had. I'd been asked to go in several times, and uh, had 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 turned them down. Uh, I had uh, I had uh, a young child. My wife and I both had uh, good uh, jobs up in the uh, Harvard uh, Boston uh, community. Uh, the day that uh, Ronald Reagan was shot, and especially the next day when I I could absorb uh, his uh, reaction and how he coped uh, with this uh, uh, near death experience, I I said to my wife Susan, I said there's not going to be another president like this uh, during my life. And um, uh, it's, I, I, could not, I could not possibly not suit up and go in. Uh, so it's time to pack our bags and move down to Washington. Wow. So it was actually that assassination attempt which changed your mind about going into the Reagan White House. Um, I, I felt at that point I couldn't say no. That's incredible. So what, what, what did you do there? You were the deregulation czar, I, <laughs> is that right? Uh, uh, the, the president had uh, very strong views about regulation. In fact, in the years between his governorship and uh, his political uh, campaigns, uh, national campaigns, he was a crusading columnist. And one of his favorite subjects for his weekly column uh, was some recent travesty uh, by the Federal Trade Commission or something like that. And uh, he was very good at it, very strong-minded. Uh, and uh, deregulation, uh, along with uh, stable money, uh, spending restraint, and uh, tax reduction, uh, were that, that was one of the four legs of his uh, economic uh, uh, policy policies. And he had a, he had a new uh, approach. Uh, that built upon what had happened in the Carter, Ford, and Nixon administrations, but went far beyond <clears throat> uh, into that. It re he required that all new rules and regulations issued by hundreds of uh, agencies throughout uh, the federal establishment, that these all be uh, submitted to the office of the president the executive office of the president for review according to a set of policies that he laid down in an executive order. And so essentially all federal regulations of any substance had to come through an office that I uh, was head of, part of the, part of the budget office uh, in, the, uh, in the office of the president. And um, uh, so, so I had the chance to work directly on things that I'd been thinking and writing about for several years in the academy. Got it. Now let's, let's go forward and talk a little bit about the American Enterprise Institute. I know a lot of our viewers, if they've heard of the American Enterprise Institute, then they think of it as, you know, as you said, as the, the home of neoconservatism, which today to a lot of people doesn't, doesn't sound very good. Uh, I think you and I first met probably in the year 2000. You'd already been uh, there for a long time. You were at the at, at the helm of this, uh, what was then called the neoconservative think tank, uh, a major institution, uh, for more than 20 years. Can you describe what what were you what were you guys doing there? What what were you up to? What what did you think that you were doing when you were building up American Enterprise Institute? A good number of people uh, that came into the Reagan administration stayed in Washington. And uh, it was not the usual story of uh, Potomac fever 
people coming to Washington, learning, learning to like uh, the good life in this city where you never really have to produce anything. Uh, you just have to be <laughs> good. At, right. uh, you have to be kind of flexible and good at moving around. There was one reason that was not a personal reason that occurred to many of us uh, that worked for uh, Ronald Reagan. We had direct experience with the difficulty of getting things done when one's uh, political and policy uh, views were very different uh, from those of the Washington establishment, the media, uh, the lobbyists, uh, much of the power <clears throat> in the, uh, the Congress. And it was a company town. It had been a company town for many, many decades, going back to the, uh, to the New Deal, uh, just as uh, people in Detroit liked motor cars, people in Washington liked government. And uh, for any <laughs> problem in society, we were going to come up with a, a solution and we were going to take some money and we were going to lay down some rules uh, and uh, we could solve any problem that the hundreds of millions of people out there in that vast continent uh, might, uh, might face. And, but there had been, during our years, I saw it in the Nixon years, I saw it in the Reagan years, there had been this powerful motive force of the Washington establishment fighting us uh, at every step along the way. I thought it would not be a bad use uh, of one's uh, time on earth uh, to stay in Washington and to see if one could be part of building a new establishment uh, that was based upon uh, uh, conservative, uh, 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 free market, limited government uh, ideals and precepts and be a sort of flywheel, a force for, a force for good, uh, administration and uh, admin in and administration out. What was your, what was your aim when you were dealing with culture and, and religion? I mean, everybody knows AEI as a, you know, as a, a limited government kind of shop, from those days and from these days, but what, what does religion have to do with this? Because I think, I think many people see uh, AEI and, and more generally the, 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 the wing of uh, the Republican and conservative movement that AI represents, see it as, um, you know, something kind of uh, libertarian. I mean, I, I think people wouldn't be so surprised if, if it turned out that, you know, people at AI were sec secretly reading Ayn Rand or something. But you strengthened the religious wing f for what purpose? Um. There was, uh, you, you have to understand, uh, and, and I would count myself as one of, as a member of the libertarian wing of the old neoconservative movement of the 60s and 70s. But you have to understand uh, that for us, libertarianism, it was not doctrinal. It was never a matter of saying there's this one value, human freedom and autonomy. And we are going to posit that this is the ultimate value. And then we're going to deduce good policy by abstract reasoning from this axiom. That was never part of the old uh, neoconservative world. Irvin Kristol's collection of essays on capitalism was called Two Cheers for Capitalism. It was not, uh, there was always something uh, holding back. Uh, and uh, what, was, what, was, what was holding back was the realization uh, that uh, capitalism and freedom to be successful required a, an ethical and social context. Uh, the important thing was not just to shout freedom from the rooftops or have a button. I can remember going to a conference, uh, a woman came up to me with a big button, freedom is my God. Uh, and uh, even in those days, I thought the whole idea was, uh, I thought the idea was preposterous. The, freedom is a, a great value. Uh, it is part of the secret of the success and happiness of modern life. Freedom is not manna from heaven. It is built up. It is a human artifact. Uh, it is something that has existed only in certain times and in places, and it reflects institutional developments. The important questions about freedom are, 
Where did it come from? What is it for? How do we sustain it and turn it into something beautiful? And um, th this, was, this was always, that was, the libertarianism in those days was quite empirical. It was because we looked at one after another government effort uh, to improve the world and found that they had perverse unintended uh, consequences. I'm not speaking for everybody at AEI. There were, there were people of different views, uh, but uh, culture and religion um, had been an important part of AEI before I came there and I merely strengthened it. So capitalism for success uh, needed to be, to be placed in a context of, um, of family, religion, culture, uh, community, social attachments, and also that we had to beware that capitalism itself, as people going back to Schumpeter and earlier uh, had taught, uh, that capitalism itself has the potential uh, to break down uh, the bonds of uh, social cohesion uh, and, uh, uh, and, and has to be, and its great power uh, needs to be guarded for that reason. Nobody knows what's been happening to the conservative movement from the inside as well as you do. Uh, people today tend to think in terms of uh, neocons versus natcons, neoconservatives versus national conservatives. And uh, you know, this, this is something that's kind of uh, tricky, I think, for many of us. There's been uh, a lot of personal breaks, fighting, a, a lot of resentment, uh, much of it focused on, on the personality of, of President Donald Trump, but you get the feeling that actually a lot of this might have deeper roots and not be just about, uh, about Donald Trump. Now, you came out with uh, a what was really, I think, kind of a watershed essay about a year and a half ago in the Claremont Review of Books. This essay was called Trumpism, Nationalism, and Conservatism, in which you, I think, disturbed, upset a lot of people by saying that, uh, that what was taking place uh, around the, uh, the uh, Trump's election, the revival of nationalism in America, was actually a legitimate reconfiguration of uh, conservatism. Can you help us with understand why you said that and, and how it was received? I had uh, been uh, impressed uh, since about the time of Trump's election, but going a little bit uh, earlier than that in the UK and in uh, across Europe uh, with this revival of the nationalist uh, spirit. Uh, and as, as the, uh, the election of Donald Trump uh, and the emergence of uh, new configurations of uh, support and opposition, uh, the resistance, the never Trumpers, the pro Trumpers, and so forth, uh, was beginning to uh, began to emerge. Uh, I, I, building on some things that uh, I had studied in the past, things that I had read, uh, Yoram Hazoni's great book, uh, other 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 uh, other works in the first uh, of the uh, of the Trump years, uh, I came to the conclusion uh, that the principle of nationalism, that the revival of the spirit of national uh, sovereignty uh, was, uh, was the uh, important uh, point uh, to help uh, interpret uh, and uh, uh, it, it, to interpret what was happening. When the nationalist movements came along, it helped me understand something. The national legislature uh, had been uh, something that had emerged as part of the nation state many centuries ago. Uh, it was an important uh, institutional artifact along with the common law, uh, due process, uh, other procedures uh, that we had uh, developed, especially in the Anglo-American uh, tradition. This, this great inheritance is something that we'd been giving up in America. Uh, with more and more lawmaking being undertaken directly by the executive, by various bureaucracies. Uh, one could see this happening in 
Europe as well, uh, with, with the twist that a lot of authority was being handed over to bureaucracies and courts of the European uh, Union. And it seemed to me, and, uh, and I'm, I'm sticking with this story, I've, I've come to feel more and more deeply about it in recent years, uh, that uh, one of the reasons for our social divisions is that there were just many people uh, that were really good at this new form of, uh, of government. Uh, they were basically uh, highly educated, highly elite, uh, verbal, smart, well-connected, uh, globe-trotting uh, people, uh, and that a lot of, that a lot of uh, citizens, uh, and not just of the United States, uh, but of nations that I know in uh, Europe and elsewhere, uh, had really been left out. Uh, because their voice was in the national legislature. Uh, and uh, if laws were simply made in this highly rationalistic uh, formulation uh, by specialized uh, agencies, and, but then everybody had to live under these laws without ever having uh, had uh, a part in their uh, creation, uh, that this was, this was part of the disturbances of the time. There was, there was more to it, uh, but... Uh, when I sat down to write to the Claremont article, it was when I realized that what I had been studying and writing about was, uh, was an important uh, component uh, of what had led to Trump's election, uh, to Brexit, uh, and to the emergence of uh, nationalist parties and governments across Europe. So if I understand the, your perspective, what you're saying is that uh, is that f small government is not just a hobby horse of uh, of uh, people who have you know who believe in in the free market over every other kind of uh, policy alternative. Small government is actually the only way that the public, that the nation, can influence the course of events through the legislature. The minute that you have this big sprawling uh, bureaucracy that's that's being run by experts, then the public no longer has an influence. And so you see a connection between nationalism, which is empowering the, the people to be able to speak in terms of their views and their traditions, and this small government view. Is that right? Yes, yes. That, that, that's, that, that's, a very, that's, that's very succinct. Uh, that is not all that the nationalist insurgency consists of, uh, but I believe it is an important part of it. And I think if we look at, uh, uh, at policies that we've seen adopted in the United States and elsewhere <clears throat> under these uh, new nationalist governments, uh, you can see a lot of that coming into focus. But Chris, it's definitely, um, it's definitely not the case that uh, all this you know, hatred against Donald Trump and against the nationalist uprising in America and in other countries, that this hatred is uh, this resistance, including among conservatives in the Republican Party, is all because of a, you know, an attachment to uh, large-scale bureaucracy, or is it? What, what's, what's taking place here? Um. Uh, the, the easy thing to say, and there's some truth to it, uh, is that a lot of it is simply objections to uh, President Trump's uh, style, character, uh, uh, rough, uh, rough methods, uh, the feeling that he is uh, deeply unpresidential. Uh, and I think that there are many people that feel that way. Uh, but the test of this would be, uh, imagine we had somebody with the policies of Donald Trump and the manners of Mitt Romney. Uh, would all of the never Trumpers say, <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. Here's somebody who's like us, a real, a real gentleman. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to be fine uh, with resurrecting tariffs uh, uh, as a mechanism of policy. Uh, and uh, we're going to be fine with having a, a hard border and immigration reform that involves uh, a serious assertion 
of uh, America's right to say who is an American and who is not? Um, I, th I think not. I, I think that the new issues uh, that have, uh, have come up uh, are, are larger uh, than the personality of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, we can see this because we see it existing in, uh, in many of the same uh, arguments in, in violent opposition to uh, governments uh, in, on the other side of the, uh, the Atlantic. Uh, and so I think that we have a, um, I, I, I think that this is the beginning of a long lasting new fissure in the politics of the, um, of the advanced uh, democracies. Uh, and uh, a good part of it is um, individuals who uh, live their lives uh, in the uh, high reaches of the prestige media and um, universities, uh, in the permanent government, uh, in many of the new uh, establishments of uh, large-scale uh, global uh, capitalism. And um, you said that uh, uh, <clears throat> you talked about how, how a, a truly nationalist government has to be small and limited government. Uh, I, th I think that that is true, but there's something else that is going on. Uh, simply because of <clears throat> technological changes of one kind or another, uh, markets, economic markets, although originally the creation of nations, are now themselves supernatural and uh, super uh, national and uh, to some extent uh, are becoming new kinds of governments uh, unto themselves. And there are many people that are quite, quite comfortable with that. Uh, and when the phenomenon first became apparent in the 80s and 90s, I was thinking, this is good because this will be a restriction on the power of nations. Similarly, as in the United States, in our federalist system, uh, uh, workers and capital can move around from state to state, and that is a constraint on the power of the individual states. But it had gotten to the it has gotten to the point that um, uh, national governments that have been sort of weakening uh, themselves through the decline of representative uh, the, the representative assembly uh, have been in a position to just stand by to be bystanders. Uh, as uh, the new global economic order created big winners and big losers within their own territory, among their own citizens, uh, with very little uh, ability or, in the minds of many people running the government, very little predisposition to do anything about it. <clears throat> uh, th this is, none of this has anything to do with the personality of Donald Trump. <clears throat> what he has to do with it is being an outsider, he saw it. He saw it before any of the insiders, uh, including, <clears throat> including strong-minded conservatives in the Republican Party. Uh, but what he has done is uh, <clears throat> established a new uh, a set of arguments of uh, constituencies, uh, uh, and they are basically those who want to uh, assert uh, the sovereignty of the nation over its borders, uh, over uh, economics, uh, and to take responsibility for the welfare its, of its citizens, rather than say, uh, simply let the market decide. Uh, and those uh, who do very well under the current order and will continue to do so. Uh, these, these are the debates uh, uh, that we have today. And uh, I have, uh, uh, I have uh, never hesitated to throw in uh, my lot uh, with uh, the new order of nationalist thinking. Wow, you know, the, as I'm listening to you, this is the, these are obviously subjects that you and I have discussed many times before, but I think that, uh, that as you were speaking, uh, I actually got a, uh, an, an image that I don't think that I've uh, that I've really seen before, this idea that, uh, that there are, are people who are um, part of a, a highly educated, a, a verbal, as you say, a, a elite, um, with, which is connected, and they like 
the international institutions uh, that are growing up around the international free market. And when you connect that to your, your description of the weakening of the legislature, right? The, I mean, the, 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 the com, you know, almost complete inability of, of Congress, but this is not true, just true in America, this is true in other countries, the almost complete inability of Congress to actually, to actually uh, le legislate, to, to debate and, and compromise and legislate. The picture that you're painting is one in which the independent nation state or the independent national state, which drew its legitimacy from, you know, from the from the people, from the idea that 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 the legislature and the president are elected by the people, that that is actually being um, crushed between these two forces. What, what one is the the uh, the the weakening of representative government. Uh, and and the move towards you know the administrative state that's on the one hand and on the other hand this you know almost almost uh, utopian love of of international institutions which kind of gradually moves uh, the United States and other other formerly you know fully independent national states in the direction of being part of some kind of uh, uh, Inter international grouping or, or 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 government. Now, usually, when you know, it's the the kind of people who say that. You know, people people will, will use the word uh, 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 universalism or imperialism or cosmopolitanism, and then everybody gets really upset at them, and they say, "Oh, you're just you're just throwing around uh, terms, demagogic terms." But here you are, you're, you're, you're no demagogue. You've thought about these things, you know, for, for, for many, many years. And is this, is this really the picture that you're seeing, that the, the, the elites are tending to move away from representative government and towards a rule, an international rule of experts? Or am I overstating that? The, um, the opposition to nationalist movements, parties, governments, uh, is not simply a matter of people who are comfortable uh, in uh, the, the, their current uh, international uh, lifestyle, uh, wanting to hold on what they have. There, there are strong uh, ideologies, there are strong arguments. Uh, uh, there are many people who assert that the new democratic, uh, uh, excuse me, nationalist governments uh, are in some sense illegitimate. Um, uh, illegitimacy has been uh, the main prong of opposition to Donald Trump. It's not just that people disagree with his tariff policies uh, or whatever, but that his election uh, was forged out of collusion with the Russians, uh, or he has uh, tricked uh, the public in some way. Uh, and you can see this in arguments about uh, Brexit in the UK, uh, in the emergence of uh, parties such as uh, uh, Vox in Spain and similar ones in uh, France uh, and Italy, uh, or the, the governments in uh, Hungary and uh, Poland. Uh, it is that in some way, these governments, these movements are not democratic. Um, however, in many of these arguments, if you if you look closely, uh, the idea of what a democratic government is is pretty narrow. Uh, for one thing, legitimacy seems to be closely connected to a, a system that elects uh, people that are liberal uh, progressives, uh, and if it elects people that are strong conservatives, there must be something wrong. Uh, there must be some trickery going on or closing down of freedom of the press, uh, as is often uh, said in, in uh, uh, the, the uh, prime minister of, um, uh, of Hungary, uh, Viktor Orban, whom you and I uh, uh, met uh, and, uh, and uh, talked with uh, at our convention in uh, Rome at the beginning of this year. Um, he is, it is said that he is an authoritarian. Well, he's head of a government that has two thirds of the parliament. Uh, a government with that large a majority is going to have a lot of uh, discretion uh, that a government that is scraping by with 51 uh, to 49% of uh, the parliament 
uh, is not going to have. If one is serious about the idea of democracy, uh, one has to be able to distinguish between dictatorship and, su and successful democracy. Uh, and one has to be realistic that the true test of democracy is whether people have the right to organize and press their views to the extent that they can overturn the government. And we've actually seen the old orders overturned by peaceful electoral processes in recent years, and that is not democratically illegitimate. Well, I, I remember back, I mean, if we think about those uh, sort of golden days of, of uh, Reagan Republicanism that people in, in the Republican Party look back on, of, of course, we all remember that, that Reagan was accused of, uh, of being an authoritarian personality. He was accused of, uh, of, uh, of ignorance, of militarism. There was uh, th this, this uh, incident, people will laugh now, but there was this incident where uh, uh, Reagan thought, didn't know that the mic was on uh, in, in a radio interview. And he said, in five minutes, we begin the bombing. And yes. the, uh, and of course it, it, it was, it was, uh, it was taped or broadcast. And then we had, was it Walter Mondale who said, you know, this joke, uh, if, if indeed it really was a joke, you know, Im implying that that's what Reagan is, is that he's a violent, you know, a violent bombardier and the, you know, the truth is coming out. All of these things were being said already back then about, you know, a man that, you know, today everybody uh, uh, looks at him as like, uh, you know, like a true liberal. I, you're, what you say is true. I don't want to regress into telling war stories, but the fact is that when Reagan did that, he did it deliberately. He knew just what he was doing. He knew that it was going to create a firestorm in the uh, media, uh, but he, was, he wanted to, uh, to communicate uh, to the folks in Moscow that maybe this guy was a little bit unstable. Uh, and uh, it was uh, it was it was it was something that was done uh, with uh, uh, with uh, a forethought uh, and uh, with the well, conscious. Well, Chris, are you are you are, this are you was saying? Preparation. Pardon me. Are, Chris, are you saying that Ronald Reagan was a troll? <laughs> <laughs> um, he was pioneering he, he trolling. Was, uh, he was, he was changing the contours of American policy toward the Soviet Union uh, from what it had been going back uh, through Eisenhower, Kennedy, uh, Johnson, and Nixon in fundamental ways. Uh, and uh, he, he was not a man who was above uh, using a certain amount of uh, artifice to accomplish his goals. Okay, so now, now let's come back to... I think I've, I think I've distracted you from you're probably homing in on me on some important point. No, no, I, 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 I could sit here hearing your war stories all night, but um, we, we just have, you know, kind of burning issues to, that we, we yep. need to think about. Um, you said that legitimacy is the, you said that legitimacy is the, uh, uh, the main issue, if I understood you correctly, that, uh, that, affects the judgment of many, many, many people in, in uh, intellectual, academic, media, political leadership positions now look at democratically elected governments and democratically constituted parties and say these parties are illegitimate when in the past people might have accused them of all sorts of things, but they would not have withheld legitimacy. I, let, let, let's say yeah. that, that legitimacy means, I, I, I assume that when you say legitimacy, you mean that, uh, that various political parties, Democrats and Republicans, Tories and, 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 and uh, labor, um, that various political parties each grant one another legitimacy by saying, here's the deal. If you are elected, then I will be a loyal opposition and I will permit you to govern. We'll, we'll argue against you, but we won't try to prevent you from governing. And saying that something is, and, and of course the other party then has to say the same thing in return. If you are elected, then we will be a loyal opposition, we'll let you govern. But when you start to say that uh, Donald Trump is illegitimate or that Brexit is Ill illegitimate, 
or that Orban or Netanyahu or Bolsonaro are illegitimate. What you're in effect saying, and, I, and I'm, I'm raising this you know, without endorsing the particular views of, of any of these parties or individuals, but in effect, if people say you are illegitimate, what they're saying is you can't participate in democracy. We're not going to be your loyal opposition. We're not going to allow you to rule. Is, is that what we're seeing? I think that we are. I, I agree with your characterization of the situation. Uh, and I think it is what uh, gives, uh, that makes the current times of uh, political uh, instability uh, uh, particularly, uh, particularly worrisome. Um, and um, uh, uh, I lived through the, uh, the riotous uh, year of 1968. We had assassinations in America. We had uh, riots. We had the burning of, uh, of cities. Uh, and there was a part of the far left uh, that regarded the system as illegitimate, uh, but, it, but it was a fringe. Uh, and, and the difficulty today is that uh, it is no longer uh, a fringe. Um, in 1968, uh, the mayor of Chicago was a ferocious opponent of uh, the rioters uh, and um, uh, uh, both, the, uh, uh, both the riots after the assassination of Dr. King and those during the Democratic Convention. Uh, today, the mayor of uh, Chicago uh, essentially is a sympathizer. Uh, she eggs on uh, the uh, rioters. She apologizes for them. Uh, she will stand up only to the most uh, egregious, well-understood uh, acts of violence. And we see a lot of that uh, in, uh, in one of our two major parties, the Democratic Party. Um, and, uh, 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 and, and all I'm going to say, all I'll say here is it's particularly it's particularly worrisome, uh, and it is. Uh, it has several distinctively American characteristics, uh, but I think that uh, in the larger context of the national conservatism uh, movement uh, that you and I are involved in, uh, there is certainly uh, a broader uh, effort uh, to make uh, people uh, who advocate uh, for a strong uh, nation state uh, that does not apologize for its borders, its ways of life, its particular uh, traditions and, uh, and characteristics, uh, that this is somehow uh, an artifact from a primitive past uh, that does not deserve an honored place in current politics. I think they're going to lose. Uh, I think that you can see some people on the right trying to uh, treat people on the left uh, as illegitimate. But I think that that is the, I think that that is the, dominant and most worrisome trend that we're seeing today. If you don't have a granting of legitimacy by the Democrats for whoever the Republicans choose as their leader, or if you don't have a granting of legitimacy by the Republicans for whoever the Democrats choose as their leader, then it seems to me that that is uh, the breaking of the democratic system, that w we all support democracy, I think, because of a simple understanding that if you don't give legitimacy to various different political parties, then you leave people only the alternative of, of violence. And the whole purpose of a democratic system and the system of legitimacy is to and the, the, the likelihood of widespread, widespread bloodshed in, in the United States or in Britain, in, in, in any democratic country. And so this direction that you're pointing to, where uh, in our case, um, large parts of the Democratic Party and even certain parts of the Republican Party look at national conservatism and say, well, that's not legitimate. Nationalism is not legitimate in the United States. You, you, we don't choose to allow you to participate. That seems to me to be a, uh, a fast road to, to bringing America to a place that we've never seen before, not in the 1960s. Is, is that what you're seeing? Um, I, yes, 
uh, and, but let me add, let me add two things. Uh, there's an intractable uh, problem here in America that very large, that we're a very patriotic uh, country. Uh, uh, we do, uh, we do love our past and our traditions. Uh, the uh, belief in the Constitution, even by people who couldn't walk you through it with much detail, uh, is very, very strong. <clears throat> and so, uh, so I think that I think that the constituency uh, for uh, uh, for a uh, for a proud and proper nationalism, uh, and one that sees. Uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, American experience uh, is one that is actually the secret for overcoming uh, racial, ethnic, other kinds of divisions that are uh, parading in the streets these days. Uh, is is a solution to it. Uh, I think that it, I think that there are enough adherents to that view uh, that it will uh, eventually prevail. I think that it is not only an intellectual uh, matter, but also an institutional matter, uh, which brings me back to my old hobby horse of the representative uh, legislature. Uh, it used to be that our laws were things uh, that uh, everybody participated in. And it's not just that um, your guys won on Tuesday, but my guys might win after the next election or something like that. Uh, it is uh, that we have a system where you have to have a pretty substantial consensus to make laws. Uh, I, our legislature uh, is, uh, is uh, usually uh, very respectful of minorities. It hashes out uh, compromises with opponents uh, before it takes a step that has the majesty of law that applies to everyone. Uh, when we're in a world where uh, if you seize the presidency, you have thousands and thousands of little lawmakers uh, who can out, out uh, can go out and do things that would never pass uh, the test of a consensus of the representative of representatives of the entire nation. You have introduced a great deal of stability and introduced uh, the idea that there is something fundamentally illegitimate about the uh, the way we are ruled and the way we make laws, uh, so so they're they're inst institutional as well as uh, uh, intellectual ideological uh, sources uh, of this legitimacy problem. We started talking about about that essay that you wrote, uh, say, saying that uh, Trumpism and nationalism is a is a legitimate development within conservatism. Actually, there's at this been a point been a, a series of Chris DeMuth uh, essays on this subject. There was there, there was uh, at, at least one in the Wall Street Journal opinion page, and uh, and several speeches that you've given at national conservative conferences. How are people reacting to this? I mean, th there's there's basically nobody who is um, more respected and from the from the direction of the heart of the Republican establishment uh, than, than you are. Uh, President Trump is an outsider. Many, many of the others who've rallied to his kind of brand of politics are, are outsiders, but, but you're certainly not. You, you're the consummate insider and everything you say sounds reasonable. How is it that uh, people are, how do people react to your identifying national conservatism is not only legitimate, but actually uh, your, your, your own policy preference? Well, um, I, I, I've had, uh, I, I, I think that, uh, I think there are some people that probably cross the street when they see me coming who didn't used to, uh, but, uh, I, but I have a lot of, a lot of close uh, uh, friends in the intellectual world uh, who, like me, come from a different place uh, than some of the other uh, new uh, national conservatives uh, do, uh, that are thinking things through. I'd like to think they've, they've found the things that I've written and suggested uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be helpful. Um, I, so, uh, but, but in some ways, you know, if you, if you take a big step like this, you're going to be ahead of the times and people are either going to catch up with you or your ideas are going to, uh, are going to disappear. Um, 
what, aside from the aside from resurrecting the Congress, uh, where I have many uh, uh, allies uh, in the in the Washington and in, in the academic communities. Um, as several other things that I have suggested, it wasn't just me, but I think that they're being picked up. Um, and uh, I think the Republicans, I'd like to see them do more, uh, but they have been, uh, they've been quite good at, quite good at this. It was conspicuous in the Republican convention. In a lot of ways, the Trump uh, Republican convention looked a lot like Jack Kemp. Uh, it was talking about economic uh, opportunities for blacks, Hispanics, minority groups, working class people uh, in a way that we've never seen in the Republican Party uh, before. Uh, this is, in, to my way of thinking, an important component of an enlarged nationalism for the long term. Chris DeMuth, thank you for joining us on NatCon Talk. Thank you for joining us for another episode of NatCon Talk. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss us next time.